Okay, so we've got a catchy title, how to prepare, execute, and present an outstanding project for EPA. So agenda-wise, there's quite a lot to cover, so I'll try not to waffle too much as I have a tendency to do. Um, we're gonna start off just talking about why projects. I think it's useful actually to take that step back and understand and consider why the Trailblazer Group has decided a project the best assessment method for a particular standard, what that means. Um, then look at the typical project requirements, um, how to prepare for a project itself. Um, the project report, which is really the key bit that's being, being assessed at the end of the process. Um, the types of supporting evidence that an apprentice might include to, to back up and authenticate the project report. What you can do as training providers or line managers, if for any of you, you are on the call, um, to, to help prepare apprentices um, for the project itself and also for writing up the project report. Um, Chelsea, then I'm going to hand over to Chelsea, who's going to share with you an example of a learning outcome from one of the standards we assess that has a project in it. Um, so you can have a real understanding from an in independent assessor's point of view, what angle they're coming at it from, because they're ultimately assessing against those learning outcomes. So really unpicking a learning outcome and understanding how complex it can be. So helping the apprentice if the apprentice can understand that, then obviously they can be well prepared to present their evidence in a way that it sufficiently covers that outcome. And then we're going to close off with some sort of best practice and pitfalls to avoid, again, based on, on the assessments that we've carried out um, for a number of different projects from level three all the way up to level seven um, standards. Okay. Okay, so a little bit about DSW. Um, I will not go into a lot of depth because I'm sure you're all familiar with the business and with Chelsea and I. Um, I'm Jake. I'm head of apprenticeships at DSW. Been with the business two and a half years now. Um, and Chelsea is one of our key account managers. So she's joining me on the call. She'll be keeping an eye on the chat. And as I say, she'll kind of finish off at the end with some of those tangible kind of examples to share with you. So DSW is a business grown massively in terms of endpoint assessment in the last couple of years. Um, our background is in financial services in the banking industry. Um, but actually, we've found that that's broadened quite significantly in terms of the clients that we work with and support and also in the breadth of the standards that we offer. Um, we do far more than financial services now. We've got a lot of pan sectors and that portfolio is growing all of the time. Um, as an organization, we've been around since 1999, um, primarily set up really as a kind of resourcing consultancy, so providing kind of talent and solutions into employers and businesses and financial services. But obviously when the levy came in, that changed quite a lot of drivers and behaviors within L an L&D context. Um, and so we moved into the apprenticeship space and really successful run at it since then. Um, we have a very large bank of associates that we work with and of those we have 250 who are sort of fully qualified vetted assessors assessing against that full breadth of standards. I think we've got about 37 in our portfolio now. Um, we recently passed the 100 mark with the training providers that we work with so a real breadth of independent training providers, FE colleges, employer providers, universities. Um, and that's been a really good experience actually of working with all of those different types of provider and understanding the different needs and different drivers and things like that. It's been a really good learning experience for me individually and I think for us as a business. Um, and of those 100 employers, we actually are supporting 1,700 employers um, currently with their apprenticeships and their apprentices. Okay, so as I said, we'll start off, I think, with talking about and asking the question of why projects. So really understanding why a particular trailblazer group who's developed the standard and developed the assessment plan had a range of different options in terms of their endpoint assessment methods. So you've got portfolios, you've got case studies, you've got tests, um, you've got projects, you've got all sorts, but they've, they've determined that a project is gonna be one of the key methods of assessing this particular standard. And so from those employers point of view, what are the sorts of things that they're seeking to gain and, and see and witness from a project that tell them that that person is is occupationally competent and so the key things really is as i see them are that the apprentice can demonstrate an awareness of business problems and what they can do to help solve those problems um, the apprentice demonstrates ownership drive ambition and resilience um, and they are really common actually within behaviors you'll be familiar if you if you're delivering different standards across different kind of occupations you'll know that the behaviors are often very very similar 
if not the same. And things like resilience are always in there and ownership are always in there. And, and a project a perfect way for somebody to demonstrate that. So I think the apprentice having these things in mind when they're doing the project and presenting the project report are really useful. So if they ask the question, actually, have I shown this assessor that I've been resilient? Maybe not. So you can go back and say, well, actually, yeah, I faced a particular challenge that came up that I didn't expect, and this is what I did about it, and this was the outcome. So understanding really what the pro why we have a project and what it's seeking to assess is really important. Uh, particularly with the level six, level seven, we get a lot of questions actually around what's, well, what's the difference in expectations from say a level three project to a level six project. And broadly speaking, it's the same. Um, broadly speaking, we're assessing the learning outcomes. We want a really well-structured and presented report that's backed up with some product evidence. But there are some differences. And certainly at level six, level seven, it is a bit more of an academic um, exercise, which sounds a bit odd given that it's, it's an apprenticeship. Um, but the expectation really is, and the reality really is, that at level six, level seven, you're expecting a project report that, that has a kind of, you know, a feel of academia about it. And in particular, when the apprentice is undertaking research and when they're describing to the assessor the research they did, um, things like analysis and synthesis are really important. So how has the apprentice used the information at their disposal and kind of looked at those individually and analyzed them in detail and then used kind of skills of synthesis to bring them all together and come up with an idea for a project proposal and deliver that project and can demonstrate that they went through that process to the assessor. That's the key expectation at level six, level seven. That's the key difference really. Um, and ability to present complex written information. So that's really important actually in that we're not going to spell check a project report and, and mock somebody down. Um, but actually there is an expectation that the information itself is presented in a clear and concise fashion. Um, and actually that it's engaging and interesting. It's quite often overlooked as that part of it. And you can get project reports that might be really good, but a bit bland. Try and encourage the apprentice to think of ways to make their project report stand out because the assessor, chances are they've, they've read quite a lot of these. Um, so if, if an apprentice can find a way of making theirs more compelling, more engaging in the way that they present it, that's going to help them. Um, and finally, I think what the project's seeking to, to, to observe is that the apprentice can manage resources effectively and crucially that they can work with others to achieve their goals. The project by its definition, by its nature, involves working with multiple different stakeholders. It's really important that the apprentice can demonstrate they do that effectively. Okay, so the typical project requirements at a very high level, so it should solve a real business problem. And that sounds really obvious, but it's, it's often overlooked. And I think if you find yourself in the situation where an apprentice is coming up with a project idea purely for the purpose of their endpoint assessment, you've got a problem. Um, because quite often it's, it's obvious that that's the case um, and it brings with it a host of other problems in that, you know, it kind of undermines the value of the apprenticeship within that business. That people, you know, the apprentices talk to each other and they'll talk to potential future cohorts. And if they think, well, I had to do this pointless project for no reason and it took me ages, it's not good really for anybody. And, and it often shows really in the evidence and in the project report. So the project itself needs to solve a real business problem. It needs to be a genuine workplace project. And then that gets the buy-in of the apprentice, it gets the buy-in of their employer. Um, and it usually means that the project itself and the evidence that comes out of it is of a high quality. Um, a really interesting question that always comes up as well is, is, does the apprentice actually need to lead on this particular project? And the truth is it's often opaque at best in the assessment plans. So the expectation certainly is that the apprentice takes a leading role in the project. Um, some assessment plans will be very clear that the apprentice needs to lead the project. And if that's the case, then they need to lead the project. Um, but in the case that it's ambiguous, so financial services is an, is an excellent example, actually. So level six, level seven financial services, these are guys working at a pretty senior level within a bank, which has probably got branches all over the world working on really massive strategic projects that span months and months, if not years, and might have kind of teams working in America in Switzerland and the UK. In that instance, you would not expect the, the apprentice to be leading on that kind of project, but it might be that there's a particular work stream within that project that they have responsibility for. That's usually fine. Uh, the advice I would give is if that's the approach that you're going to take, 
just check with us first, either check with the assessor or check with the DSW team um, and we can give you a view on it. But certainly in the past, we have seen examples where that sort of approach has been taken and it's worked really well. Because for all somebody might just be working on a particular work stream within a project, if that's a huge project and it's a multi-billion pound investment for their employer and they've done a really good job of managing their work stream, why wouldn't we use that? Why would we make them do something else? Um, the next one's really important and again is something that's often overlooked. Um, we do still see projects that are submitted that are not really a project. Um, they're describing business as usual um, and quite often they're really good examples and, and it's a shame to have to go back to the apprentice and give them that feedback. But a typical example would be, okay, with COVID, my line manager went off and so I had to step up and manage the team for four weeks because my manager was off sick. And that's not, not really a project. It might be that you can form it into some sort of project, but that activity in and of itself is just an example of the apprentice demonstrating really good leadership and resilience. But actually, it's not a project in that it's not a discrete piece of work with a set of kind of targets and goals and milestones and stakeholders and reporting mechanisms and all of the rest of it. So it's really important to, to avoid that scenario. Now the actual kind of the mechanisms, the outputs of the project then are typically a project proposal and a project report with support and evidence. So the project proposal, I think in every single one that we assess, we'll have a template that's in the toolkit. Um, and the template's a mandatory document and it's really used so that the apprentice and their employer and the training provider can all have confidence that the project idea that the apprentice has come up with is suitable. Um, so it's not a business as usual, it is a proper project, but also that it's going to give them the opportunity to demonstrate the competence against the learning outcomes. At the end of the day, the assessors are assessing the project against a list of learning outcomes that they've got. They have to assess against those learning outcomes because that's what the employers have written in the assessment plan. So it's really important that, that the project itself is going to allow the apprentice to demonstrate that they've ticked all of those boxes. And I absolutely despise that expression but in a way, it's helpful to think of it in that manner because there are certain boxes that the, the assessor is going to have to tick for them to pass. So you've got the project proposal, which will be signed off before the apprentice starts the project. Um, we do often get them where we'll get a project proposal for a, print, for a project that, that was started you know, weeks prior to that. So the apprentice shouldn't be starting the project until the proposal has been approved and signed off. Then you've got the project report. The project report's the meaty bit. It's, it's the most important bit. So we're going to focus on that in, in a bit of detail in the upcoming slides. Um, the support and evidence, while often isn't assessed in and of itself, because the assessment plan will talk about a project report of, say, four and a half thousand words, the support and evidence is really important for a number of reasons. And again, we'll discuss that and explain why. Um, and last but not least, and I'll probably say this repeatedly throughout the webinar, the project has to cover specific learning outcomes. So it will usually say in the toolkit and the assessment plan, these are the learning outcomes or the KSPs, or these are the past descriptors and distinction descriptors that the project must assess. So it's really important that it does this, that it covers those in a very clear fashion. Okay, um, I'll probably do one more slide and then invite Chelsea to come on and read out any questions if we've had any so far, just because I can't monitor the questions and, and present at the same time. So the next section is around preparing for the project itself. So this is not preparing necessarily the project report, it's preparing to undertake the actual project. Um, so it sounds very obvious, but understanding the scope of the project and setting that out. So everybody involves really clear on what the objectives of the project are is the most important kind of starting point. Um, the employer and training provider have a really important relationship and that's usually the skills coach and the line manager in understanding those learning outcomes and making sure that the apprentice also understands so that when the apprentice is doing their project and gathering the evidence and then writing up the report that they're aligning it to those learning outcomes. And at this point, there needs to be a real commitment, particularly from the apprentice's employer that they understand that they need to give the apprentice the time and the resources that they need to do the project and also to write up the project report. Um, we do see some instances and it's particularly difficult at the minute because of the pandemic and lockdown and things. I understand that 
but it's really tempting, I think, for an employer to say, oh, well, no, sorry, we've got too much to do today. And then before you know it, the apprentice is trying to write up the project report in a single day. Um, and it's not very fair on the apprentice, really. It's not giving them a comparable experience to others. Um, and I know there's only so much that training providers can do in that respect, because at the end of the day, the business always kind of takes over on the day. But having that firm commitment and understanding up front and having maybe review points is a good way of kind of tackling that. Um, so at least everybody understands that it's really important that a commitment is given to the apprentice, that they, they're going to be given the time and the resources they need to complete this activity. Um, the RAG rating is a really, really useful activity to do at this point in time. So if you've got, say, a number of learning outcomes that are supposed to be met by the project, RAG rate it. So literally against each learning outcome, right, this one's a green because they're definitely going to be able to demonstrate that they've worked with different stakeholders. It's a no-brainer. This one's a red because actually I think they might struggle with whatever element it is. And it's important not to just do that at the start. It's important to actually use that RAG rating as a diagnostic tool as the apprentice goes through and actually undertakes and completes the project. Because most projects, if it is a big, work, significant piece of work, will suffer from an element of creep of scope. So it'll set out to achieve one thing and then the business needs change. And by the time you get to the end, you know, it's setting out to achieve something slightly different. Now that's fine, but it needs to be understood and managed because if you've done a RAG rate and at the start and said, great, everything's green, nothing to worry about, then the scope of the project changes halfway through. Some of those greens might turn amber or they might even turn red. And it's better the devil you know it because if you can identify that early on, you can do something about it. So you can either build stuff into the project or support the apprentice and provide an evidence that shows that they've actually met all of those learning outcomes. And as an endpoint assessment organization, it's it's difficult because our hands are tied by what's in that, that assessment plan. So if the assessment plan says these learning outcomes must be met and it might not be the apprentice's fault, their project might have changed scope and they get the end and they say, but I didn't do that bit because my project changed. From an assessment point of view, we can't then pass that apprentice. We have They have to meet all those mandatory outcomes. So it's really important that you keep on top of that. Um, timings, again, I mean, this is, different from one standard to another so I'd refer to the toolkit but a lot of um, there are a lot of strict timings that are often attached to projects I have personal views on on some of those and um, we are in active discussions with kind of policy makers and, and EQA editors around project timings um, but you do have to abide what it says in the assessment plan so I would use the toolkit as a starting point and if you think it's unclear in any way come and ask us the question because there are strict timings in place for projects around when the apprentice can start the project, when they can write up the project report. And in a lot of newer standards, what we're seeing is really strict timelines on, okay, well, if the, if the project proposal isn't submitted within two weeks, it's a fail. You have to start again. If the project isn't completed within the strict time frame, it's a fail and you have to start again. And the real difficulty, I think, with projects as opposed to, say, a test or even a portfolio is if you fail the project and you have to start again, that's a, it's, a, it's a massive ask because you then haven't asked the employer, well, find another huge project for this apprentice to do. It's totally unrealistic. So getting it right first time is more important for a project than it is for any other assessment method by far. Uh, so the timings are really important. The word count, um, quite often see um, reports coming in where the apprentice just hasn't paid any attention to the word count. And that's quite an easy thing for uh, the employer or the training provider to identify before it's submitted, run it through a word count, check what the rules are in the toolkit around the word count and, and appendices and headings and stuff, because they are different from one standard to another. Um, typically, the rule that, that we would employ as an endpoint assessment organization is it'll usually have a word count, it'll say plus or minus 10%. If we receive a project report that's kind of below the minus 10% in terms of word count, it would be an outright fail. Um, because that's the parameter that's been set out in the assessment plan. If we get one that's more than 10% over the word count, the assessor will read up to that point and then they'll just discount anything that's included thereafter. So the word count's actually really important because it might be that an apprentice has kind of fluffed it up and bulked it up with loads of stuff and then the really important bits at the end and that gets missed because it's not included in the word count. Um, research and, and the proposal, so the research in particular 
this is another important point actually so where you have a strict timeline that might say okay you can't start your project until after you've gone through gateway and a lot of standards are like that there is an element of the project that realistically can have been done and that's the research because if you're doing a project and it's a significant work-based project that is inevitably going to be based on research it's not necessarily research that you're undertaking there and then it might be historical research and data sets and things like that that you've got at your disposal um, so when an apprentice is thinking about the project there is an element that they can be doing in terms of gathering data that they'll then use to form their research piece and part of the project proposal and project plan and um, project report sorry um, so there is an element of research and that can be done there and if the apprentice is doing that I would really strongly encourage them to be capturing that at the time and in particular any subsequent rationale um, and especially level six level seven where there's an element of analysis and synthesis in the research undertaking if the apprentice kind of you know while they're on programs, undertaking some of that research and saying, right, okay, I could do that and that. I'm going to pick this option because of X, Y, and Z. And that rationale would be a really good either to put in a project report or to put in as a piece of support and evidence because it really demonstrates to the assessor the process that the apprentice went through to determine that that was going to be the best solution. Um, so what I'm saying really is while the apprentice is kind of undertaking research and other bits of work, like you do with the portfolios, gather it there and then put it into a, a, a depository somewhere and then you can draw upon it later on. It's much harder to go back retrospectively and going through emails and folders and stuff like that. Um, last couple on here then and then we'll, we'll pause to see if there are any questions. Um, use, so use the project proposal format in the template. We do design them um, to, to maximize the apprentice's opportunity really. Um, so we, so we try to be as clear as possible as we can within those. These are the learning outcomes that need to be hit. Tell us, you tell the assessor what you're going to do to make sure that you hit those outcomes. It's really important to, to use those. And again, if you get feedback from the assessor on that project proposal, use it. So I'll just pause there for a moment and see, Chelsea, if we've got any questions so far. Yeah, we've had some questions coming through. Um, so the first one, Karen's asked, um, when you say the project proposal needs to be signed off, does this need to be signed off by the endpoint assessor? Yes. Um, so I think in every instance that I can think of, it, it generally does. I think there may be one standard yeah, where it was changed. Compliance. Yeah. Yeah, what I would say is that's one of the questions where I would refer to what it says in the toolkit. So if the toolkit says it's the employer, then it would need to be the employer. If it says it's DSW, then DSW will do it. Thank you. Um, Kerry's asked, are the learning outcomes you mentioned the components of the standard? Yeah, so it's, 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 it can be confusing and I apologize for that because in the way, because the standards are all written by different employer groups, they use different approaches and they use different terminology. And because the policy is evolving over time, the templates that, that are used by the Institute are slightly different. So I think that the, the two most common approaches are, we'd either have a set of learning outcomes where they'll be broken down into knowledge, skills and behaviors. So a knowledge statement might, for example, say the apprentice demonstrates um, a thorough understanding of legal and regulatory frameworks within the financial services context. So that will be the learning outcome that's being assessed. Um, and again, that's why it's really important because quite often, particularly with the older standards and those learning, that learning outcome approach, quite often when you read it and you think of it in the context of a project report, it doesn't marry up particularly well. Um, and so there is actually, unfortunately, an element of the apprentice almost having to kind of um, sort of mould the content of their, their report to make sure that they, they, tick, they do tick that box. So they might have written really eloquently about the project that they've done. But actually, if there's a learning outcome in there that says the apprentice demonstrates an understanding of legal and regulatory frameworks and they haven't demonstrated that, they would ultimately fail the project. And again, that's kind of our hands are tied from an assessment point of view because that's what we're told to assess by the employer group by the assessment plan so understanding those learning outcomes and thinking about how you're going to present the information in the report 
to make sure it ticks those boxes is really important. So the first is the learning outcomes. So they are really the component kind of KSBs, if you like, within the standard. And the newer assessment plans, so anything from sort of the last 18 months onwards, they don't assess those learning outcomes individually. What they do is they assess past descriptors and distinction descriptors. And what they essentially are are descriptors that are based upon the individual KSBs. But it will be really clear in, in the toolkit as to what's being assessed within the project plan. So if you're at all unsure, I'd say your first point of call is check the toolkit. And if you're not sure after that, get in touch with the SW and we'll be able to help you. Great. Um, can the scope of the project change throughout? I assumed it was fixed once the proposal was approved. Uh, yes, yeah, an interesting one. So I think ideally from an assessment point of view, it would be great if the scope didn't change, but in reality, if it's a genuine work-based project, which we're very much encouraging it to be, then the reality is that they do change in scope. And I think that that's fine. Um, but the thing you need to be aware of is, is it still going to allow the apprentice to fulfill those learning outcomes? And if the answer is no, then you need to come up with, with a solution that makes sure that they do. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, if, so, sorry, just to go back on that one. So I think if, it, if the scope were to change so significantly that it wasn't recognizable as the same project that they started which is unlikely but if, if you suspected that that scenario was about to emerge then my advice would be to get in touch with DSW and we could give a steer on it. Great thanks Jake um, Dan's asked um, where can we get the project proposal template as the kit I have for sales exec level four doesn't have one and I can actually make a note to, to share that with Dan um, Sort that one out. Yeah, it may be down that you've got a draft version of the toolkit. So we've we've definitely got one in there now because I know with the sales exec one, that's one where we've been really specific and given even a template for the project report. Because with the sales exec, if the apprentice fails even a single learning outcome, not only do they fail the project, but they're not allowed to resubmit the same project report. They have to start a brand new project and write a brand new report, which is pretty unrealistic so for that reason that's one of the ones where we try to keep it as sort of tight and clear as we can and structured as we can so that the apprentice doesn't find themselves in that scenario yeah great um so next question um do you mean if the project is not submitted by the due date then it's a fail or do you mean if it's a it is a fail if the project itself is not completed yeah, so in it's the, I mean this is typically in the newer assessment plans. The older ones are not not as clear, but certainly in a lot of the newer ones, it really is quite strict. And it will say if the project report isn't submitted, so the sales exec I think they've got ten weeks to do their project report. And so what it says in there is if they don't submit the project report within that ten weeks, they ultimately fail the project and have to start a new one. Um, so yeah, there's a theoretical scenario in there that it may be no fault of the apprentices and they get the week eight and they're due to finish on time and something happens, someone goes off sick and then it's okay, I'm not going to finish till week 12 now. Um, I think in those circumstances, it will probably be the reasonable adjustments, special considerations policy will come into play where you could put forward a, a case for that particular individual apprentice and we could consider it. Yeah, I think um, that answers Anita's question next, actually. What happens if they cannot complete the project in the time scales and the project's outgoing? Perhaps it's not their fault due to unforeseen circumstances. Would it be a fail? Yeah, so I think, again, that would definitely be reasonable adjustments. And what we would do is we'd have a look at it and we'd determine whether or not we, as an assessment organisation, could make the decision to afford a dispensation in line with the policy. Or if it was something that looked a bit kind of left field, then we probably would escalate it to the equip and seek permission. Yeah. OK, and um, we've got a few more questions coming through. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one is um, from Nicola. Please, could we have an update on when the new team leader and ops department manager toolkits will be available so we can access these templates? Now, Mike, might be wrong, Jake, but these um, those standards have got project proposals in them, have they? Yes. So, oh, you, you've caught me out there, Chelsea. So, <laughs> I think the ODM has a project proposal in, so in that they yep. need to do a project, but they don't need to necessarily kind of complete the project. 
Um, so they don't, it doesn't need to be fully implemented, I think is the terminology in the assessment plan. But those toolkits will be available um, by the end of next week, hopefully this week. I've got, <laughs> apologies, I've got them on my to-do list to sign them off. They've all been done, it's just in the final sign-off process. So I'll solve those. Great, thanks Jake. Um, from Donna, when you say the project proposal, do you mean the project plan, for example, in the FS admin qualification? Yeah, and that's another good question because that's another tricky area where, the, where we're at the mercy of the terminology um, because I think in the new ODM they talk about a project proposal when they're actually talking about the project itself. Um, usually, so unless there's a specific terminology used in the assessment plan, we would use either project plan or project proposal for that first bit. So this is what I'm proposing is my project. Would you sign it off, please? And then the project report is the actual report itself. Okay, um, great. Next question from Kerry. Um, I asked about the learning outcomes slash components because I noticed the wording in the toolkit. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, is there going to be a toolkit for the customer service level three? Yes, yeah, um, that's also commissioned, um, so it'll be a little bit later down the line, I think probably in about three or four weeks time. Okay, um, Angela has asked, is there an updated toolkit for level three team leader? Oh, that's the one you've just mentioned. Yeah. Um, and end of next week for that one, Angela. And then um, I think you've got a thank you from Dan. Um, okay, so Karen's asked, um, based on what you've said about the project, the feedback I've received, I was told that the project and the portfolio are uploaded at the same time and then the feedback is given. So I think that one's in relation to ODM, okay. um, the old ODM. So that, because that's a standard specific one, should we? Yeah, I think anything that's standard specific will need to take offline because the rules are different for each one. Yeah, I'll make a note that we'll pick up with Karen. Thank you. Um, and that's it, um, I think, for now. Great, okay. Um, I'll crack on then. I think I've got maybe two or three more slides and then I'll hand over to Chelsea. I think we should still have about five, 10 minutes left at the end if there are any further questions. Okay, so we'll move on now to the project report. So, as I say, the, the main output, if you like, so the thing that's being assessed is usually the project report. So when, when you look at the assessment plans for a lot of standards and they talk about the project, they don't really talk about Gantt charts and RACI matrices and PIDs and et cetera, et cetera. They talk about a report. Um, so in most cases, it's the report that's actually being assessed against the learning outcomes. The report can be supported with um, kind of product evidence and other bits of evidence like the Gantt charts, et cetera. They help to provide context um, and they help to authenticate the apprentice's own account of what happened, which, which is what they're putting in the report. So it's the evidence, although it's not necessarily directly assessed, adds a richness and a value to the submission that will massively help the apprentice if it's done effectively. Um, so we don't usually, I think sales exec, is the only standard where we have a template for the project report with the others. We tend not to use them because project methodologies and documentation are always different from one employer to another. Um, there's an element of personal preference in there, but there are certain common tools and techniques that I think apprentices can use to produce an effective report. So we're just gonna kind of cover a few of those now. Um, sounds really obvious, but just ensuring that the report has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, this ties in with another one on there, which is the third bullet point, I think, which is it's really important to remember that the assessor is not familiar at all with the apprentice or the work that they do. Um, if they've reviewed, say, a project as part of the proposal, they might have gleaned something from that. But, but largely speaking, they're not, they're not familiar really with this project. So it's really important not to use kind of acronyms and not to use too many assumptions within it. And the structure of the report itself, really critical in conveying complex information in a way that's digestible and understandable by somebody that hasn't been involved. And that's actually quite a difficult thing to do, I think particularly for complex projects at level six, level seven. Um, and that's why having a clarity in the format 
and the presentation of the information is really, really, really important. Um, the project report should be clear as to what research was undertaken and the options that were available and the rationale for selecting an option. And that's a bit that's often overlooked is the apprentice will know in their mind, okay, well, these are the options I looked at and I picked this one because I knew that that would end up in this, this happening and that one would be too expensive. That one would probably get cancelled or delayed. Those sorts of things are not always made clear in the report. Um, it's a really easy thing to miss. It's a really easy thing to include. So it's a good piece of advice to give apprentices. Um, the clear and logical manner is kind of what I said before. And again, I'll go back to that point earlier of making sure that the, the report's compelling and engaging and interesting. So I've seen loads of reports for things like compliance and risk at level six. Might excite some people, <laughs> doesn't particularly excite me. So if you put yourself into the mindset of an assessor who's, okay, I've got 10 apprentices to assess this month. As an apprentice, I would want to make sure that my, my report and my work stood out in some way. And that can be quite difficult to do if the subject matter is quite dry. But I think that's why the use of kind of visuals and embedding the evidence in and charts and graphics and things like that can be really useful. Um, and using concise and compelling and engaging kind of language is also a useful tool. Um, and the last thing on this slide is, again, which I said before, just making sure that the apprentice uses all the time that they've got available. So that's partly on motivating the apprentice and getting them to understand that, you know, it's, it is still needs to be thought of as a timed assessment. I mean, the time might be six months, but it's a timed assessment. Don't leave it all to the last bit. Try and, try and start it early if you can. Um, the report itself, um, anyone that's been involved, which is probably everybody on, on the webinar, in writing big reports or case studies, assignments, essays, those sorts of things. It's really hard if you try and tackle it in one big go. It's a lot easier actually if you start off with just doing mind maps and notes, starting to form and synthesize ideas. That just makes it so much easier than thinking, okay, well, I'm gonna book a day out and do my project report. Don't do that, just book an hour out and do a bit at a time, then book a day out once you've kind of got the ideas formulating in your mind. So just little things like that are quite important. Trying to work backwards from the submission date and as an apprentice, I think it's good to leave at least a week if possible where you've kind of finished your report, you put it to one side, you forget about it, you go on holiday, you do, you do whatever you want to do and you go back to your report with a fresh pair of eyes because that's when you start to think, well, that doesn't flow very well. There's a typo there. I forgot to include that part of it. All those sorts of things, which you get word blind if you're trying to just cram it all in and do it in one go. So that break and that period of reflection is actually really important in making sure that the final product is as good as it can be. Um, the six W's is really important. I'm not necessarily saying present the information in the report in this particular format, but actually when you're reviewing the report as an apprentice and thinking, right, have I made it as clear? Have I covered everything that I want to cover? In asking those questions, you will identify the bits that you've missed out. So actually, oh, I haven't covered the who. There's a bunch of stakeholders there that I forgot to mention or why I didn't include the rationale part. So asking those critical questions as part of the reviewing of the report before it's submitted is really important. Um, smart objectives sounds really basic and obvious, but actually when, when apprentices have used that, you can see that they've used it particularly useful in term when they're doing the um, project proposals as well because it provides absolute clarity to everyone involved what, what the objectives are and how they're going to be achieved. Um, the STAR approach and similar approaches are quite useful in terms of um, presenting the information um, in a clear and compelling way. Um, analysis and synthesis of research again I think particularly level six, level seven that's a key expectation. Um, Mapping, so mapping is really important um, because poor mapping, what it does is it, it risks evidence being missed and frankly frustrates the assessor. Um, so if you're presenting a report to somebody and you want them to be impressed by that report, it is hugely in your favor to make it really easy to read that report and to understand where you're saying it meets an outcome, be really clear as to which outcome and where. Um, so the mapping works two ways. One is you'll have the referencing table in the toolkit so you can say, okay, this learning outcome is covered on pages seven and 12 of my project report. And then probably the best and it's the simplest method is where the apprentice at the end of a certain paragraph will just put LO1 or LO6 um, and then in, in a different color, they might put in blue or red. 
and it sounds so basic, but it just makes it so much easier for the assessor. Um, if it's not that kind of granular, then there's a lot of to and fro and of right, okay, well, which one's it met? And, and, and I totally get that there's an element of holistic assessment. Um, and our assessors are absolutely trained to recognize that and to award marks where they see it. Um, but having that granular mapping where you know that something definitely meets an outcome, show the assessor, tell the assessor, it will only help you. It's not going to hinder you in any way. Um, and the use of the product evidence. So it might be if you've got kind of huge data sets and spreadsheets and stuff, obviously you're not going to embed them in the body of the text. Um, so they would be kind of signposted and referenced separately. But if you've got something like a dashboard or a screenshot or a particular chart, that can be really good. If it's something that's not going to kind of distract too much from the flow of the text, it just helps. It helps break the text up and make it more, make it more readable. It helps to make your point more clearly and provide that evidence in a way that's not saying, right, okay, I've read that bit. There's the mapping document. Right? Where's this product evidence is over there. If, if it's embedded where appropriate, it just makes it flow much better. Um, and the last bit on product evidence is it can be used to use the word count more efficiently. So particularly if the apprentice is struggling to convey everything that they want to within the maximum word count, product evidence is a good way to, to get around that. Um, so for example, if there's that learning outcome I talked about before, if, if the apprentice demonstrates deep understanding of financial um, services regulatory and uh, legal frameworks, it's going to take quite a lot of text to write that and put it into the report. And if you think I'm going to run out of text here, what you can do is you can include copies, say, of legal frameworks and regulatory, or it might be even internal policies. You can include that and then you can have a statement in the project report that says, okay, I followed the, the policies, please see attached. Um, maybe a little bit more than that, but what it means is you're writing, say, a paragraph rather than a full page to cover off a learning outcome or a particular point. So product evidence can also be used to use your word count more efficiently. Okay, and the last few points really on the project report and tips and tools and techniques. Um, being really clear about the actions that were undertaken and the desired outcomes and whether or not those outcomes were met. Um, stakeholder mapping, um, so things like racing matrices are really useful. Um, just check the report and make sure you've been really clear as to who the stakeholders were. And particularly at the higher levels, the expectation is that you do have something like a race where you, you, you can explain really clearly who's involved, what they need to know, what level of information and when they need to know it, what processes you've put in place and the evidence then that, that you've followed that. So, okay, this person is the project sponsor. They don't need to know the ins and outs of it. They just ask for a fortnightly update in the form of an email, great, well explain that, put in some copies of the email so that's really clear to the assessor. Um, this third point is on that issue of resilience and, ver and several other behaviours to be honest. If, if the apprentice can demonstrate that things changed, obstacles came up, which always happens in projects, um, talk about that actually because it probably is good evidence, certainly of certain behaviours that you might have, have shown like adaptability or resilience, or managing conflict, um, time management. There's loads of different things that that can be covered off by showing how we've tackled obstacles that came up. Um, and then finally, you've got evaluation and, and reflection. So evaluation obviously is really important that the apprentice kind of uh, describes the efficacy of the project. So how well did it actually meet its purported goals? And then in reflecting on it, what might they have done differently? Um, and there's that, that, that good old tool of the what, so what, and now what. I think, again, it's not necessarily you don't want <laughs> apprentice to write what, so what, and now what in their report. But if they ask themselves that, those questions when they're reading their report and when they're reading the evaluation and the reflection at the end of it, have they explained the so what? If not, okay, go back and, and put that in. Okay, so I'm just conscious of time, so I'm not going to dwell on this one too much, but there's an example there of the types of support and evidence um, that might be included within a project report submission. To be honest, I think it's all stuff that I've just discussed anyway. Okay, so final bit from me, and then I'll hand over to Chelsea, is um, just to recap really on preparing the apprentices mentally as much as anything else. Um, for undertaking the project and also writing up the project report. So communication is absolutely essential. Um, apprentices aren't 
always forthcoming and telling you how they actually feel about an assessment. Um, so using the tools and kind of coaching techniques that you've got as skills coaches to, to try and elicit that from the apprentice and understand how they're genuinely feeling and what support you can put in place to support them. Um, making sure that apprentices have read the toolkit um, and that they're familiar with those learning outcomes, that's probably the most important bit of advice that I could give because that's the bit that's going to be assessed. Um, is the apprentice confident with the project? Are they confident that it's going to be sufficient to meet the outcomes? Are they confident that they're going to have the time and the resources that they need to be able to do it properly? Um, and if the answer to those questions is no, then what can you do to support them? Um, do they know what bits of evidence they're going to use? So, I mean, that slide that we just looked at, share that with apprentices and share some, some examples of the sorts of evidence that you could and should be gathering. Gather it as you go. Don't leave it till the end. Um, and then just more holistically really have a think about what you can do to support them with their project. So is that speaking to the line manager and making sure that they've got enough time? Is it helping them to understand the learning outcomes? Is it preparing them mentally? Um, you know, also all range of different things that you can do to help support the apprentices to prepare. So I'm going to stop talking <laughs> and hand over to Chelsea for the last bit. Thanks, Jake. Um, yeah, I'm conscious of time, so just wanted to let everybody know that we're happy to go on a little bit past um, 11 and stick around to answer some of the questions that have come into the, to the chat function, uh, but it will be recorded as well, so if you, you do have to drop off, you can catch up in, on YouTube after. Um, now this, this part is an example learning outcome, and what I thought would be useful is to just break a learning outcome down and show the different components of it and it's really aimed and the, the, the next couple of slides actually are aimed at apprentices that are looking at learning outcomes and thinking okay what does this mean um, and something that we definitely encourage them to do and, and for yourselves to do with them you know if, if, if that suits. So the learning outcome um, it's just an example but the apprentice takes the initiative to meet challenging individual and team performance measures in line with organisation policy, values, standards, and sector relevant regulatory requirements. So if we break that down a little bit, um, what we're looking for is has the apprentice demonstrated to the assessor that they've done this proactively and what prompted them to take the action that they did? If we think about performance measures, has the apprentice made it clear to the assessor what the performance measures are in their role? Have they done this for individual and team performance measures, like is asked? Um, has the apprentice been able to demonstrate that they acted in line with at their organisation's policies, values and standards? But crucially, is it clear to the assessor what these things are? For example, how is our assessor going to know the organisation's values if they've not been included in the project? Um, like Jake says, they can be included in the, the references and there's appendices to save on word count. So for the past descriptor for that learning outcome, the project lays, clear, lays out a clear business plan slash business case showing the options considered and their reasons for inclusion and rejection. So we're really looking to see all of that. Options considered relates to decisions the apprentice has made on how to approach their project. It may include things such as the purchase of capital, goods or services. And has the apprentice shown in their project report that they explored different options? How did they decide whether to include or reject each of these options? Think about the factors such as cost, time and risk. Um, lots of apprentices want to go for the distinction grades um, and the distinction descriptors are in the referencing table for the project. So the project recommendations or resulting implementations have the potential to or gen, have the potential to have genuine positive impact on the business or the wider industry slash society. So in many cases, an organization may not actually see the impact of the project until sometime after its implementation, by which time the report would have already been submitted. But if this is the case, make sure that the apprentices Apprentice explains how the business will measure the impact and when this is likely to be possible. What does a successful outcome look like and how will this be measured? 
So that's really showing that the apprentice is, is really doing a lot of critical analysis um, of their project and the impact of it, which is going to get them that, that, that higher grade. It shows their reflectiveness. And one thing also to consider is that it is um, holistically assessed. So it's easy to see how the, these different assessment criteria overlap. So the apprentice can meet all of them holistically in their project. For example, they might sub submit one piece of evidence that may map to several learning outcomes. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. And on the next few slides, we've got some, um, some tips and some uh, pitfalls to avoid. Yeah, best practice. A lot of these summarise some of what Jake and I have already shared. Um, so apologies for that. But um, definitely rag rating as the learners go is really, really going to help them keep on track. Um, demonstrating the impact or potential impact, like I've just said on the previous slide. Start thinking about the project early. Um, that's really key, um, but especially sticking to the timeframes of writing the project report that's um, in, in the toolkit. Good evidence will cover multiple learning outcomes, so they don't have to worry about having, you know, vast amounts of evidence um, if they can map it to several. We do provide the templates in the, the toolkit, so use those, review those ahead of time and um, when you're thinking about preparing for your project. Ensure that it maps to the learning outcomes, be aware of creep, take ownership of, of the work. I think what's really important is that the apprentices appreciate the opportunity that the project has got to contribute to their organisation and their self-development. Um, so you know, taking ownership over that will really, really help them. Consider the level. Um, so they, they do range. There's going to be more required for the higher levels, you know, level level six, level seven. We're, we're talking about degree and master's um, levels. So we want the apprentice to understand that and approach it as such. Um, and another one is ensure there are no GDPR breaches within the project. Um, you can redact email addresses and names um, from emails and things like that um, that are submitted um, and it's always important that the apprentice goes through their project and, and redacts, redacts any breaches. Right. Pitfalls to avoid. Um, so projects done outside of the acceptable period, we, we do see this a lot and I think that's driven by the fact that apprentices have a project and you know they, they want to submit it for their EPA which is is understandable but we are bound by the rules in the, the assessment plan um, so make sure they stick to that. Another pitfall to avoid is that the apprentice should avoid just telling a story. Um, sometimes this can happen when we, when we get projects through but it's best to really be clear as to the goals, activities and outcomes of the project. Um, Another thing to maybe work on with your apprentices is to um, is their structure. So making sure that they have that beginning, middle and end that Jake's mentioned. Um, you'd be surprised, but we, we do tend to see quite a few apprentices ignoring the word limit, unfortunately. So, yeah, go through that with them. Product evidence. It's not just enough that they, they tell us about their project. They really have to show it in their, their product evidence that they submit. And then the rest are a summary of some of the things we've mentioned. So we do see GDPR breaches a lot. Um, apprentices, I think, slowly are getting used to going through and redacting evidence and breaches and, and getting used to that GDPR um, or the regulations. Um, and we, we do also see um, projects that, as Jake said, are, are more business as usual than a kind of distinct project. So that's that's one thing that we, we advise to avoid. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, so more, any, any more questions at this point? Um, I noticed that some have gone into the, t into the chat actually. So um, Jake, this is probably one for you. Mm -hmm. Do you want the project script to have the learning outcomes noted or just the referencing table? Um, yeah, the script as well. I think there's there's no harm in doing that. I think it just helps the the, the assessor to navigate. 
And I think it also helps give the apprentice confidence that they've met all the outcomes in the report. And Jake, um, could you please explain more about effective use of mapping, please? Yeah, um, so I'm trying to remember what I, what I meant when I said that. So I think effective use of mapping would be what what's just been described there actually in the previous question. So I think almost kind of mapping both ways. So using the, the referencing table to indicate what evidence there is against each learning outcome, but then also mapping that in the report itself. So, because I think when the assessors assess a project report, what they'll tend to do is they'll, they'll almost just read the report and ignore all of the mapping and stuff like that. Because if you don't, you'd totally lose the flow in the context of the report. It's better to read the full report in its entirety and then kind of go through and assess it afterwards. Because um, I think as well, by reading it in its entirety, you'll pick up on the opportunities for holistic assessment and things like that as well. Um, but I think if the apprentice is going through and mapping anyway, in theory, it shouldn't be any hardship for them to against each paragraph write which learning outcomes they believe that paragraph's covered um, and I think if they do that it just makes it easier to find the evidence um, and it makes the whole piece flow better as, as a kind of holistic piece of, of work. Great thanks. Um, Sandra asked can we incorporate charts and diagrams into the report itself? Yes, you can. Um, I would pay attention to the rules and the toolkit around the word count because they're not always consistent to the assessment plan. Some will say um, it excludes headers, for example, where some will say it includes headers. Um, so absolutely, I would encourage the use of embedded wherever it's appropriate, I think, to embed the evidence. And it's personal preference, really, but the way I see it is it's better to embed it in the report if it's, if it's possible to do that because it just makes it flow better. Great, thank you. Um, what would be the best practice in respect of GDPR and security where emails cannot be submitted as evidence? Uh, I think as a starting point, it's always better to submit a redacted email rather than just not submit anything at all. And I totally appreciate that quite often that can be redacted to the point where it, it adds little value in, in reality. Um, but I think that's better than submitting something that has no product evidence in at all because it, it's instantly you know it's not present a very good impression because somebody in theory could have completely made that up um i think one thing i meant to mention earlier actually is that in portfolios for example where we have apprentices that are struggling to include product evidence because of commercial sensitivity things like witness testimonies can often be used, not exclusively. Um, we couldn't have a portfolio that was just made up of an apprentice's account and then their manager's account because the assessor needs to make an objective, independent judgment themselves. Um, but things like witness testimonies from line managers are a really useful tool because they also provide an additional lens for the assessor to understand, okay, I've seen it. This is my opinion. This is another kind of professional's opinion as well. It's quite useful. So there's nothing really necessarily to say you couldn't include something akin to a witness testimony alongside a project report. Um, I would just be mindful of not making that something that makes it too onerous to assess. So you wouldn't want to submit kind of a 13 and a half thousand page report and then a thousand page witness testimony as well or an hour long witness testimony recording but maybe some short or series of short kind of witness testimonies or similar to help validate what's in the report. Great okay thanks Jake. Um, Tony asked um, a specific question about ODM level five the new one. So mm -hmm. the guidance is that the project proposal must be submitted within 12 weeks, but can it be submitted earlier than 12 weeks? And if so, is there a minimum amount of time that should be adhered to? I'd need to go back and check, but I'm pretty certain that we would allow it to be with in fewer than 12 weeks. However, obviously there'd be a concern about comparability if, if it was, say, six weeks or seven weeks. Um, because what we need to ensure is that apprentices are getting kind of an equal opportunity um, and so I think I wouldn't want to give that answer now one thing I, I should say actually is we're going to run another webinar um, when we've released the toolkits for team leader and level five ops manager 
just to run through and answer some of those questions in a bit more detail. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, the rest. Oh, hang on. Um, Tony has asked, does the mapping count towards the word count? Um, good question. I don't think I've ever had that question. I would say no, because I think the whole point in the word count is is the text that's kind of adding value, if you like, whereas the, map, the mapping would fall really under sort of referencing in, in annexes. So, no. Okay. Um, that's all of the questions, I think, for now. Lots of thank yous. Um, that's it. Great.